Thank you for joining us. We're here to chat with Dr. Craig R. Smith, a man of considerable credentials in the literary and academic fields, an author of 15 books and a 16th about to be released called Confessions of a Speechwriter. Uh, before we get started, let's find out you know, a little bio on you. Where'd you come from? Where were you born? I was born in San Diego. I was a naval brat, so I was born at the uh, San Diego Naval Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, went to elementary school through the third grade there. My father was transferred to Virginia. I spent five years in school in Virginia. Then we came back to San Diego. I went to uh, UC Santa Barbara, where I got my bachelor's degree. Went to the City University of New York. I like going back and forth across the country uh, to get a master's degree, and then I went to Penn State and got a PhD there. And then I began my teaching career at San Diego State. And what was the PhD in? In communication yeah. studies. I see. Is, is that something that you'd always aspired to as a youngster? Actually, what happened to me and, and, and what changed my life was I was in high school and I got recruited onto the high school debate team. I wasn't good at anything, you know, I wasn't good in sports, I, you know, I was okay in the classroom, but I, 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 I didn't have any extracurricular activities, and suddenly uh, I took off in high school debate, and so when I went to college, I was in college debate, and I was a history major, because I loved history, uh, and then I double majored into communication studies, and then went on in that field, that's what got me over there. And how long were you in the academic world before Washington called? How did that I was I was I was at, at San Diego State for four years, and the University of Virginia bought me away and promoted me, and I was there for three years, and then I went to work uh, in the White House at age 31. And how how did that happen? What was well, the trigger? Well, it's, 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 it's a great story, and it could only happen in America. Uh, I was, as I said, I was teaching at the University of Virginia, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, invited me down to give a guest lecture there. So I went down to Chapel Hill and I gave this guest lecture at 10 o'clock in the morning and they said, you know, the President of the United States is going to be here. President Ford is speaking on the campus at noon to the future homemakers of America, of all things. So let's go over and see him. So I gave my lecture and then we went over and, and watched the President and the speech was not good. Uh, I was embarrassed and my colleagues were poking fun at me because I was a Republican. And uh, that night I got back to Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and I couldn't sleep. And so I got up and I wrote a five-page, single-spaced critique of the president's speech. And I sent it to the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and then I could sleep. And I didn't think anything was going to come of it. And about a week later, I got called from uh, the personnel director at the White House. And he said, is this Dr. Craig Smith? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, well, we just had a speechwriter leave. Would you have any interest in interviewing for the job? And Did I, you think this was a joke? I thought it was a joke. And, and I actually said, th th I think this is one of my debaters pulling my leg, because I was a debate coach at the time. And he said, all right, look, call the White House switchboard and ask for my name, and they'll put you through. And so I did, and I, got, and I couldn't believe it. So then I came up for the interview, and it started with him. And then I was taken to uh, Bob Orban. And Bob Orban had been a comedy writer for Red Skelton and for Dick Gregory. And he was the editor for the speechwriters. And he supplied humorous material for the president. So I went through my interview with Bob Orban. And he then took me in to see Bob Hartman, who was the counselor to the president and a very close friend. He'd been uh, with uh, Gerald Ford when Gerald Ford was in Congress. And I had my interview with him which was interesting, and uh, then he said, you know, I think we can work something out. I think I'd like to have you on the team. And I, I was just shocked to go from being a, an associate professor to a presidential speechwriter in a matter of weeks. Um, it, was, it was the American dream, it really was. And tell me about President Ford. How did, how did he react to you and you to him? Well, I remember the first time uh, uh, Bob Hartman uh, brought me in to meet the president. Uh, I had a beard then. And I was off a of campus, and uh, uh, Bob Hartman said, Mr. President, this is your newest speechwriter. And uh, the president looked at me, he had a pipe, and he turned his head a little bit, and he said, you're a professor, I understand? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, they haven't done very well here. Uh, they try to make me too eloquent. They uh, put too many big words in my mouth, and uh, I don't want you to try to do that. And I said, uh, no, sir, uh, Mr. President, I, I think I'm trained. Uh, I know you want to speak the language of the common man, and I'm going to help you do that. Um, and he said, well, that's good. He said, the other problem with professors is they never get the work in on time. Uh, they're, 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 it takes them forever to get anything done. And I said, well, you know, for my training, I, 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 I think I can do this pretty quickly and, 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 and take care of it. 
And he said, well, he stood up and shook my hand and said, welcome aboard. Um, so he, you know, he was a very direct guy, and I, I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, my first assignment was, was really kind of amazing because he was going to speak at the Southern Baptist Convention. And, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter had spoken there and brought the house down, and so uh, they asked me if I would take that speech. So here you have me, a Roman Catholic, writing for an Episcopalian president speaking in front of the Southern Baptist. So we had to do some adjustment. Uh, and I worked through the speech, I talked to Southern Baptist ministers, I, I sat down with the president to get a feel uh, about what, he, what kind of language he would be comfortable with, and uh, we put the speech together, and he went down and they were meeting in Norfolk, Virginia at the time, and he uh, delivered a few lines of the speech and was suddenly interrupted by applause, and that hadn't happened to him <laughs> very often, and so it threw him off a little bit. Um, but then he got his place back and continued on, and he was interrupted several more times uh, by applause. And the Washington Star, which was a functioning newspaper in D.C. at that time, uh, praised the speech uh, highly. And so my reputation was suddenly made with the president, and uh, from then on I had a much closer relationship with him. Did you think that he delivered a good speech? I mean, what, capable in the delivery of the speech? I think everybody is. Um, the president's problem was that he didn't rehearse much. He thought it was kind of unmanly to rehearse a speech. And, of course, you know, Ronald Reagan has given yeah. the lie to that. Franklin Roosevelt rehearsed his speeches all the time. And so one of the things that I worked uh, with the staff on was getting the president some time so that he could rehearse speeches, and then they were much better. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that was, that was odd that I, that I came across that nobody had picked up on, uh, was very strange, uh, Everything the president says is scripted. Now, he doesn't have to use the script, but that's just the way things are done, just in case. He was getting an award from the Boy Scouts, and I had written the speech for him on cards, the way he liked it. And uh, I met him in the Oval Office. I gave him the cards. He looked at the cards. He put them on his desk. We went out. He gave a perfectly good speech to the Boy Scouts. I thought, that's great. Two weeks later, the Mormons came, and they were giving him a, a replica of the Pioneer Monument Mm -hmm. that they have in Salt Lake City, a little statue. And I wrote the cards down and everything else and, and met him in the Oval Office. And he took the cards with him and he went out into the Rose Garden where he was getting this award and stumbled through the speech. And I thought, that, that's really odd. So we were walking back to the Oval Office and I said, Mr. President, with all due respect, you did really well with the Cub Scout, uh, the Boy Scouts a few weeks ago. Here, not so much. Well, what happened? And he said, well, they had cameras. I, I, you mean snapshot cameras? He said, no, they, were, they had newsreel cameras. It made me nervous. Well, here was a man who'd been in the House of Representatives, who'd been the minority leader, and nobody to that point had detected that he was camera shy. So when we went to Kansas City, where he gave his acceptance speech for the Republican nomination, which closed the gap in the polls, uh, we rehearsed him in front of live cameras five times, all the way through the speech. And that's why that, that speech worked. But that, I think that's what speechwriters need to do, is diagnose their clients and find out what kinds of things they need, what kinds of things will make them better. Yeah, so uh, not long after that, you stuck around there in Washington and you were a speech consultant to H.W. Well, actually, Bush? actually um, after the election, I was offered a position at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and uh, to start a communication division there. Uh, so I came down as finally a tenured full professor and started the communication division uh, in, in 1977 uh, after the election. And um, in 1978, I met a guy named Bill Harris, and he was trying to enliven uh, the Republican Party of Alabama. You know, now, you may recall in those days, if you won the Democratic primary, you won the election in the South, and was Al Alabama good. was as deep as you could get, and George Wallace was the governor. Uh, had and the, a Democrat. And a Democrat. So um, I met with Bill Harris, and he had some good ideas. Uh, Nixon had started a Southern strategy, and then it had fallen apart with Watergate. So Harris wanted to restart that. He thought that people in the South were conservative and they should be in the Republican Party, and I agreed with him. So I joined the board of the Republican Party, all six of us, and, uh, and we started working on things. Well, the first thing we needed was somebody to come over and speak and raise us some money. And we asked all the big names, Conley, Reagan, all those people, and we couldn't get anybody to come over. And finally, George Bush agreed to come over. 
And uh, we greeted him, and I reminded him that he'd been head of the CIA when I was in the White House. And uh, he, he spoke at a dinner, and then I met with him afterward, and he said, uh, I talked to Jerry Ford about you, and I was wondering if you'd become a consultant to, to my campaign, because I'm running for president in 1980. Don't tell anybody, but, you know, we've got to start now. And so I said, that would be great. Uh, he said, okay, what I want you to do is come to Houston, and uh, I want you to meet my wife and my staff. I think they'll sign off on you too, but, but let's, you know, make it formal. I, I got to make sure, Barb, as he called it, uh, that everything was all right. So one uh, Sunday uh, in uh, 1978, uh, I arrived at George Bush's uh, house at the side door, and I had on a three-piece suit. I, I, you know, looked really formal. I wanted to interview well. And he stepped out the side door to greet me, and he was in an Izod, you know, polo shirt kind of thing. And he said, if you'll get out of that silly vest, I'll cook you breakfast. <laughs> so we went into his kitchen, and I took my coat off, I took my vest off, and he poured me a cup of coffee. And I was standing there with a the cup of coffee, and Barbara Bush walked in. And she looked at me, and then she looked at George, and she said, George, that man is standing there with a cup of coffee, and he doesn't have a saucer under it. And I don't know what got into me, but I just looked at her and I said, ma'am, I walked into your house in a three-piece suit. If you think I'd spill anything, you're out of your mind. And she laughed, and George laughed, and, and, and we became friends. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was on the staff. And, uh, and my first speech for him was in front of the Bear County uh, Texas party. Uh, we went over there, and then we were flying on to Tulsa. So he gave the speech, and it went well. And they gave him a, uh, an American flag. And they gave Barbara a bunch of yellow roses, which, as you know, is the Texas yellow flower. Rose of Texas. The yellow rose of Texas. And then we got on a Learjet, and it took off, and we're flying to Tulsa. And I looked at Barbara Bush, and I said, gosh, those r roses look beautiful. And she said, I'd rather have the damn flag. <laughs> and, and I thought, wow. I mean, she was very blunt and a lot of fun. And, uh, and we went to Tulsa, and the speech went well there. And uh, it turned out that... As you know, Bush was the last man standing against Reagan in 1980. Well, we made it all the way into June. And then uh, Reagan won the Oregon primary, and, and uh, the press said he was the winner. And Bush graciously bowed out. And then Reagan considered putting Ford on the ticket, which was very interesting to me, my old connection. You may recall that uh, Ford then was interviewing with Walter Cronkite. And Cronkite said, um, you know, how's this going to work? You were a former president, uh, and you're going to be on with, now you're going to be a vice president with Reagan. And uh, Ford said, well, it'll be kind of a co-presidency. <laughs> and Reagan heard that, and that was the end of the Ford vice presidency. And then, much to his credit, and I think it, it just shows the marvelous judgment of Ronald Reagan, he put George Bush on the ticket. Yeah. united the party, and the rest is history. Now, of the, these two presidents you've talked about, President Ford and President Bush, I think are considered by most to be straight shooters, honest yeah. men, yeah. and still the press seem to have uh, had a good time vilifying them and, and, and pointing out their frailties. You know. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame because, you know, when I was, I worked at CBS, I started as an intern for CBS and then became a consultant to CBS, and almost everybody there was liberal, and they tried to suppress it as best they could. Uh, but every once in a while, you see this kind of thing hopping out. And, and I think the most famous moment was the night of the State of the Union in 1988. This was, this was Ronald Reagan's last State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. And earlier in the evening, uh, Vice President Bush was appearing on the CBS Evening News, giving an interview uh, with Dan Rather. And uh, one of the things that, that went on with that was that uh, uh, Rather kept interrupting Bush. Bush said, let's move on and do something else uh, and talk about other issues. We're done with Iran-Contra. Uh, Rather refused. Bush criticized Rather for that. Rather cut him off. And it, it, was, it was a brutal moment in, in terms of television news. I mean, it was, it was, it was really amazing. And, and if you were in Washington, D.C. at the time, everybody was just aghast at what had happened. Yeah. I was in Tulsa at the time, and I remember my jaw dropped yeah. When, yeah. when that moment went down. Yeah. Um, of the presidents that, that, that you followed in, in your career, who was perhaps the best of the speech givers? Who delivered the best speech? Oh, I think Ronald Reagan. 
Uh, Ronald Reagan, people you know, need to remember that Ronald Reagan was probably our most practiced public speaker when he went in to office. He'd made 50 motion pictures uh, written by some very good writers. I mean, if you look at Newt Rockney, All-American, you look at uh, King's Row, uh, those, uh, Dark Victory, those are great scripts. Yes, now, right. Reagan had a photographic memory, and he would not only remember his part, but everybody else's part. And so he would cue you when you were in a, on set with him, and that's what made him so popular to work with. People loved working with him, and I think it's one of the reasons he became president of the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. Um, he also had done radio work before that. Uh, after his uh, motion picture career began to decline, he became a spokesperson and ambassador for uh, the General Electric Company, uh, spoke for 2,000 hours for General Electric. He th also did the GE Theater, which was the third most popular show on television at one point. He then did De uh, Death Valley Days uh, uh, for a while, and it was only then that he jumped into politics. Uh, I mean, he had, he'd given speeches endorsing Eisenhower and, and yeah. Nixon, um, but the speech for Goldwater in 1964 was magnificent, mm -hmm. and that made him a candidate, yes. and that allowed him to then run for governor. I had the uh, great uh, pleasure of interviewing him several times when I was in news here in California, yeah. and um, uh, he was the st most straight-talking of all of the politicians of that period yeah. that came through here, yeah. uh, you know, either on a national or statewide level. Ronald Reagan was terrific at that. Yeah. Um, so you also have moved into the private sector with your speech writing? Yes. Lee Iacocca? Yes. Um, I was working as the deputy director of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and the senator I was working for was not going to be reelected to that post for various reasons. And as you know, in Washington, you become associated with one kind of political character, and <laughs> their career becomes your career. And so uh, I thought it was time to, to try something else. and. Uh, Lee Iacocca was looking for a speechwriter and was recruiting me. He, he lived near Gerald Ford. I owe a great deal to Gerald Ford in this story, as you can tell, and uh, out in Rancho Mirage. And um, Ford recommended me, and so I interviewed with Lee Iacocca. And during the interview, if I said five sentences, I'd be surprised. Iacocca is a very domineering, gets what he wants kind of guy. And uh, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Uh, it was a lot of money at the time. It was 1982. Uh, so I moved to Detroit and uh, tried my hand uh, at, at writing for Lee. Uh, it was business writing, so it was very different. I was writing about rubber polymers and miles per gallon. And uh, one of the things we did uh, that, was, that was great fun and I think really important, uh, we introduced the first seatbelt law. Uh, uh, Lee advocated for it. Um, I wrote the speech he gave in Lansing, Michigan to convince the Michigan legislature to vote for it. They did, and that set the example for the rest of the country. And uh, so that was, that was nice. And then President Reagan asked Lee Iacocca if he would head the Ellis Island Statue of Liberty Foundation to refurbish those things. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'll never forget the day that Lee and I went to Ellis Island to survey it. And it was, it was a dump. There were weeds all over the place. Um, but as they took us through on the tour, we were both in tears because his parents had come through Ellis Island and my grandparents had come through Ellis Island. Uh, and so that was easy to write for. You know, I'd written the bicent some of the bicentennial speeches for President Ford, and now I could write about the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island for Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca is a lifetime Democrat. How did you get along? How did he and Ford get along? Actually, he had been a Republican. He had. When he worked for Ford, he, uh, uh, the Ford Motor Company, yeah. Henry Ford, uh, he had been a Republican, and then he switched when he became president of Chrysler and became a Democrat. Uh, and then he became more independent, or at least he said he became independent. Um, but his, his inclinations were conservative. Uh, he wanted a balanced budget, he wanted lower interest rates so that people could afford cars. Uh, he had uh, very conservative ideas about national defense. Chrysler owned a tank plant at the time and made defense uh, stuff. So, uh, you know, Lee was uh, easy to work for. I think, he, I think he voted for Mitt Romney in the recent election, didn't he? I think so. Yeah, I, think so. I believe he did. Yeah, um, you testified in front of a congressional committee. What was that all about? Well, I've I've testified a, a number of times. Uh, when I returned from uh, uh, working at Chrysler, uh, I I took over the head as president of the Freedom of Expression Foundation. We formed the Freedom of Expression Foundation, and the object of the Freedom of Expression Foundation was to protect broadcasters' First Amendment rights. 
They were supported by the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Miami Herald, ABC, NBC, CBS. Uh, and uh, we, we set about uh, trying to correct some of the restrictions that were placed on broadcasters. Mm. Uh, two of the most egregious, there was this thing called the Fairness Doctrine. I don't know if you remember I it. I do remember, yes. But it was well-intentioned. It was promulgated in 1949 by the Federal Communications Commission actually trying to give broadcasters more freedom to editorialize because they had been prohibited from editorializing altogether from 1943 on. So we felt that they had the same rights as newspapers and should have the right uh, to editorialize. Um, the, the, the problem with the way the Fairness Doctrine was written, it said you had to uh, editorialize on issues of importance and you had to present dissenting views but it didn't tell you how to determine what was the important issue, and it didn't tell you who were the responsible dissenters. And so people were constantly harassing broadcasters to get on the air to present their point of view, and the FCC would immediately launch an investigation, and then you had to call all the lawyers in. So that became a, 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 a huge mess, and we got that repealed. And then the, the, the other problem that we went after was commercial speech. Um, there were restrictions on televised commercial speech that we thought were unfair, and uh, we wanted to protect uh, uh, broadcasters and advertisers and their right to sell their product. And those were the things that I testified for on Capitol Hill. Now, they, uh, there was some chatter in, uh, during the recent, recent campaigns, the presidential campaign, about the Fairness Doctrine again. What's that about? There, is, there was an attempt uh, uh, among liberals to bring the Fairness Doctrine back because they wanted to uh, uh, close down people like Rush Limbaugh, uh, people like O'Reilly. Uh, what they don't realize is it would also close down Rachel Maddow. She has to present alternative points of view instead of her own. I mean, she has every right to say what she wants as long as she calls her program uh, a commentary program. It isn't the news. O'Reilly is not the news. They're commentary, commentary programs. Yeah. But the liberals were resurrecting the idea to go after conservatives because they thought that Fox News and some of the commentary shows were doing a great deal of damage. And they wanted to try and punish them by reinstituting the Fairness Doctrine. But I, it, it went nowhere. I, I, I recall that somebody said that there was kind of no difference between uh, MSNBC and and Fox, and if I'm not mistaken, Fox is, uh, is has a real news organization. Oh yeah. And as I as I understand it, MSNBC is strictly commentary. Right. Is that correct? I think that is correct. Uh, the 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 fun I always have on election night is I have a bunch of professors over for election night, mm -hmm. and I said now before we turn, they all they all want to say, well, let's watch it on MSNBC or let's watch it on on. Uh, 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 CNN. Uh, I said, no, 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 well, 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 let's wait. Let's write down what we want to see. What information do we want tonight from the election reporting? So we get this list. And then I turn on the, the channels and, I, and we make a comparison. About an hour in, uh, you find out that Fox is giving you a lot more news than the other channels are. Do you have, do you have uh, favorites out there in the news business uh, in the style in which they cover? I mean, y you certainly uh, know and have lived during the time of Edward R. Murrow when you yeah. were a child and, and yeah. uh, you know, some great newscasters, great beat people. Who do you like now? Well, uh, my favorite, and he isn't around anymore, was Walter Cronkite. And, and I was able to, I'm lucky enough to work with him. Uh, on the 68 uh, elections, the 72 elections, election night, uh, 74. Um, and Walter uh, began as a kind of independent Republican, but the Vietnam War moved him more and more to the left. But he was always objective in what he did, and I think that's why he became the most trusted man in America. He was terribly, terribly worried about saying what was the truth and not letting any ideological bias show. And I, I really admired him for that. And the research unit that we had at CBS at that time, when it was the Tiffany Network, was really terrific. I don't think you can find that these days. There's, there's too much about how one looks, how one sounds. Um, you've got people, um, you know, having Katie Couric do the evening news to see if that works. 
Um, uh, Brian Williams, I think, is probably a perfectly nice guy, but uh, I, I have a hunch it's his, his affability, his fluency, and his good looks are what get him on the air. That isn't how you became an anchor man in the old days. No, it wasn't. Even with Chet Huntley and, and, and David, David Brinkley. Brinkley. Yeah. yeah, that was a great pair, too, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Um, which presidents have, uh, have gone wrong in the content or style of their speech making that you've noticed? I mean, when you, uh, it, you know, watch them over the years, you say, oh boy, could I help them? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, one of the things that speechwriters need to look at is venues. Where are these people good and where are these people not so good? Even Ronald Reagan had trouble with press conferences. And we finally worked with some of his people and said, why don't you put him on a couch with the three anchors and just let them talk? And as you recall, they did that one night and it was magnificent. But him standing up and taking questions, sometimes he misspoke himself and had to retract a statement. And so what you do is you look for, you know, where are people really good? Nixon, for example, was really good at a press conference. Uh, every time, even during Watergate, when he held a press conference, his ratings went up. Um, the, the, the one I was most frustrated with was George Bush Sr. Uh, Mr. Bush was wonderful at press conferences, learned the material, knew it well, could name every member of the press corps that was in that room, and he wouldn't hold them at night. We couldn't get him to do night press conferences when he could have showed all that talent off. I mean, John Kennedy was the first one to do that. Uh, Nixon did it. Reagan did it but we couldn't get Bush to do it, and then finally we convinced him, and by then it was so far into the 1992 election cycle that the news media said, you're just changing this for campaign reasons, so we're not gonna cover it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, sometimes these people uh, uh, are, are not so good because they don't take the advice uh, of their counselors, and then the counselors get blamed for what, for what goes on. Uh, I, I, I think one of the presidents that, you know, really could have used some help was Jimmy Carter. Um, uh, you know, one of the odd things is I was the first presidential speechwriter hired from the communication field, uh, uh, communication studies, as, as, as I teach it. Um, there had been some news people hired, some journalists. There had been, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter even hired a, a novelist to write his speeches, and that's probably why they didn't work, because it's a very different medium. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think writers need to look at those things, assess the talents of their client, maximize the good things, minimize the bad things. Just one final question. Yeah. Do you miss Washington? Sometimes, but not as much as I used to. Good. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Dr. Craig R. Smith. He's got a new book coming out, uh, Confessions of a Presidential Speechwriter. Thank you. Thank you.